Okay, yeah, let's get started. <clears throat> um, so thanks everyone for joining. I know people are still um, still joining as we speak, um, but I um, am happy to um, introduce Dr. Abigail Dickinson, who's a research neuroscientist at UCLA. Um, she's going to be presenting on neurophysiological mechanisms and markers of autism across the lifespan. Um, before I introduce her though, I just wanted to share some housekeeping um, items. One is that actually it's really exciting that we're having a talk today. Today is April 2nd, which is World Autism Awareness and Acceptance Day. And this, it really um, launches a whole month of autism awareness. Um, and our center will be doing many, many different activities, including our autism um, symposium at the end of this month. And so stay tuned um, for emails and other um, you know, announcements about various activities that we'll be hosting over the course of the month. Um, this distinguished lecture series is sponsored by the Tarjan Center at UCLA, the UCLA Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Center, as well as the UCLA Brain Research Institute. Um, so we're very appreciative for that support. Um, so if you have questions as an attendee, you can um, provide those questions in the Q&A, which is in the, the window down below. Um, you're all Zoom experts by now, so you know how to do that. Um, I will be um, just monitoring those questions and can field them for Dr. Dickinson at the end of the talk. Um, this talk also will be recorded and will be posted to our website shortly after the event. So with all that said, it is truly a privilege um, to introduce Dr. Abigail Dickinson. I honestly can't say enough, um, but I'll try to be brief so that we actually get a chance for her to talk about her incredible work. Um, she really is the force behind many of the advances that we've made over the last few years in electrophysiological biomarkers in autism at CART. Um, she's, I was trying to think of adjectives th that describe Abby and there's many, but I think the ones that sort of best capture her that, are that she's incredibly creative, very fastidious, passionate about her work. And I think most importantly, she's very collaborative and generous with her time. And she's really been recognized over the past few years as a methodological expert in electrophysiology. And she shares her skills and her insights with researchers across the world. And that really just speaks volumes again to her generosity. Um, so her background is that she actually joined CART as a postdoctoral researcher in March of 2016. Um, she actually came from England um, before um, joining CART. She completed her master's in cognitive and computational neuroscience at the University of Sheffield in the UK in 2012. So she's a young one. I look at these dates and I'm thinking how she accomplished so much in such a small period of time. Um, she then um, earned her PhD um, at, uh, at the Sheffield Autism Research Lab with Elizabeth Milne in 2016. And then we were lucky actually to be able to convince her to um, you know, uh, uh, cross a continent to come and join us at UCLA. Um, her research in her PhD was focused on studying visual perception and um, really neural processing using EEG and autism. And that dissertation actually was awarded the prestigious um, EU Engineering and Physical Science Research Council Award. Um, so her main interests, and she's been at CART, have been really to use different methods to best capture in the most robust way possible um, neurophysiological mechanisms of early prediction in autism, as well as um, mechanisms underlying really the heterogeneity in autism. Um, and her methodological expertise has been already recognized. In 2017, she actually was awarded the INSAR Young Investigator Award. Um, in her short time here, she's already published um, more than 20 papers, five of which have been first authored just in the last um, three years um, in this EEG work. And so again, her work really speaks for itself. Um, and most recently, she's really um, been um, instrumental in spearheading a very large innovative collaboration with an imaging group called IBIS, the Infant Brain Imaging Study, which is a multi-site study using MRI to identify early, early changes in the brain that predict autism. Um, and so we actually received some funding last year to add EEG to this consortium. And as you, as I'm sure Abby will discuss, you know, it takes a, a, quite a bit of um, thought um, and rigor to be able to collect these kinds of tricky data in infants across multiple sites in a way that's rigor enough, rigorous enough to be able to use them as biomarkers really for future um, clinical um, utility and use. Um, and Abby's really spearheaded those efforts. And so um, I just cannot say enough about the importance of her work. And I would say that finally that I, you know, I've been honored to be considered her mentor, but really I consider her a colleague and someone from whom I learn a tremendous amount as well. Um, and so with that, I'll stop and I'll let her work speak for itself. Um, thank you, Abby, for joining us today and for being a part of the CART family. <laughs> 
Thank you, Shivali, uh, for that really kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to present as part of the CART Distinguished Lecture Series today. So as a trainee within CART, I feel very fortunate that I've been able to work, work alongside different faculty members and researchers who take really different perspectives to understanding neurodevelopmental disorders. And this has really helped me widen how I apply to my specific training in EEG methods to autism. And it really has helped shape the direction of a lot of the research that I'm going to present today. So as a broad overview, um, I'm going to be talking about, in general, um, how we apply EEG techniques and why these hold particular potential in autism, as well as giving some precise examples of how we should be grounding our approaches um, when we're approaching these different EEG measures that we can select. And then finally, um, I'm going to talk about how we can use EEG to track different types of developmental change in autism um, and hopefully use this to understand how it evolves across the lifespan. So jumping straight in, um, I wanted to just give a brief description of what EEG is for anyone who's unfamiliar, as well as giving some definitions that will be relevant to the work that I'm presenting today. So EEG is a functional technique which means that it's measuring the brain's activity rather than its physical structure. And specifically, EEG captures electrical signals that occur when neurons transfer information to each other. And while these signals are really small, um, when many neurons are firing together um, at a population level, these signals add up and we can measure them from the surface of the scalp using EEG electrodes. And one of the major benefits of EEG is that it records on a millisecond, um, a millisecond precision, which is the scale at which neuronal activity is happening. So this is important because it means that we can see the dynamic changes that are happening in the brain in real time. And because of this, we're able to capture the different types of ry rhythms that contribute to the signal um, from different neural sources or populations. So this um, very crude graphic here is just showing that sort of different populations are firing at different um, speeds and we can characterize these patterns of activity in terms of their frequency. And as well as sort of looking at the frequency content, we can then start to figure out how much power um, is contributed by oscillations at each of those frequencies. So when we talk about sort of like gamma power, this means these like higher frequency oscillations um, and we can categorize them right down to delta, which is really slow oscillations. And the color here just maps onto sort of how each of these frequencies maps onto the signal um, across the entire spectrum. And capturing this population activity, um, it's not just convenient that we can capture it at this level, it's really important because these rhythms shape how we experience and interact with our world. So for instance, we need higher frequency oscillations, um, so oscillations that would be considered the beta or gamma range, to be able to support learning and attention. Whereas when we're asleep and we need to sort of go through different stages of healing sleep, we cycle through these lower frequency oscillations. So things like delta and slow theta. And a really oversimplified view, uh, like rule of thumb would be that the faster the activity, the harder your brain's working. And two of the specific rhythms I'm gonna talk about today are um, beta, uh, sorry, alpha and gamma, just to point those two out. And another thing I just wanted to go over is the fact that our brain's ability to generate and sustain these rhythms isn't something that just happens automatically. It depends on many underlying neurobiological factors and it's obviously really heavily influenced by what's happening at a synaptic level. So when brain development's disrupted, um, as it is in neurodevelopmental disorders, it also changes how these patterns of activity develop. And this is particularly relevant in autism, uh, where we see a characteristic behavioral phenotype that shows that certain patterns of brain activity that we rely on for social functioning um, and those that we need to be able to switch flexibly between a broad range of behaviors aren't happening like they should in autism. And that's why these sort of behaviors, we see differences emerge around three years of age. But we know that, we know that these differences um, at a behavioral level uh, caused by differences in early brain development. And this is the differences in brain development that we've been able to identify in autism. We know that they're very broad. Um, so there's a range of common and rare genetic variations and environmental risk factors associated with autism, as well as different types of um, neuropathology at 
several levels of measurement within the brain. But generally, um, we know that all of these different types of um, factors in the brain are important for synaptic, and circuit, synaptic function and circuit activity. So EEG potentially offers a way to measure convergent neur neural differences in autism um, and possibly help us to understand how they specifically alter brain function. And the immense potential of EEG has not gone un unrecognized. You can, in the top right here, this is just a chart of EEG publications in autism by year. And you can see that it has taken off as a technique. And this is not surprising. It's a really flexible tool. We can apply it in diverse recording environments. It's also relatively inexpensive, um, which means that we can scale it to large populations. And important for neurodevelopmental disorders, it's also particularly tolerable. So individuals who might not um, be able to undergo other awake neuroimaging techniques might be able to actually contribute with an EEG. Um, so it gives us insight into some brains that we wouldn't be able to study otherwise. And although EEG is a really, really broad technique, we can apply it in countless ways, um, but I would argue that the two sort of main priorities that drive our applications of EEG in autism are to better or well, to understand neurobiology and to develop clinical markers. So to develop, develop markers of brain activity that we could me measure that could help inform um, either detection or um, tracking intervention efforts along with behavioral changes. And ideally, and obviously understanding neurobiology and clinical markers are very linked. And ideally we would have EEG markers of specific neurobiological differences that were clinically helpful, but we're not quite there yet. Um, and one of the things I'm gonna hopefully um, convince everyone today is that we really need to be clearly thinking about rooting our studies and analyses in one of these approaches, because if we sort of just go in looking at the EEG signal in general, it's not precise enough in a disorder that's as broad as autism. And we run the risk of ending up with a literature that's made up of like isolated EEG findings that don't really mesh together in any way and don't move us forward um, towards either of these priorities. So to sort of give you a better idea of what I'm talking about, I'm borrowing sort of um, approaches from my background in computational neuroscience, where we talk about studying, taking a, bottom-up or top-down approach. So an example of a bottom-up approach would be where we know exactly what neurobiological difference we want to measure. We identify the EEG signal that would um, reflect that difference, and then we map onto behavior. And conversely, if we're taking a top-down approach, we can start with the behavior or clinical characteristics that we're really interested in studying and find the EEG measures that help tell us um, about what might be sort of causing those differences at a behavioral level. And then again, we'd be mapping onto neurobiology further down the line. And again, um, taking one of these two approaches, I would argue, um, helps us be more precise in how we apply these methods. And it means that we're more likely to sort of have interpretable and meaningful results. And they're very different. Um, so we are very used to the top-down approach um, in the autism EEG world. But I'm going to give two sort of examples today of these different approaches and also talk about how we might be able to align them a bit better. So um, how we might be able to keep sort of when we're studying really low level markers, how we can keep um, the, the ultimate clinical relevance of those in mind. So I'm first going to talk about anchoring our approach in neurobiology, um, because this is how I first approached autism research. Um, my background in co cognitive and computational neuroscience meant that I was really focused on EEG techniques and measures that, again, are anchored in really specific neurobiological differences. And a good example of this, and the one I'm going to talk about today, is levering EEG measures that are rooted in our understanding of visual processing. And this is a good way for us to sort of go in because the visual system is one that we understand very well in terms of its neural mechanisms. It's conserved across species and we've studied it for decades. And we know how neural mechanisms sort of act in order to help, in order to um, help us process incoming sensory information. And I'll describe why that's the case um, and why we can anchor our EEG approach using this knowledge. But first I just wanted to briefly go over why I was interested in um, 
the neurobiology of vision in autism. And I was specifically interested in these sort of like low level mechanisms because of the sensory differences um, that represent a really commonly altered domain in autism. So conservative estimates place the prevalence of sensory differences in ASD at least over half of the population. Um, and these differences are really complex. They affect a range of modalities and they affect individuals in really different ways. So there's some um, pretty well-known examples of individuals with autism who have specific types of um, sensory differences that they consider positive. So this is a British artist called Stephen Wiltshire who can recreate an amazing cityscape after going over like in a helicopter once. And he attributes this to his perception for visual detail. Um, and we see sort of like similar themes talked about in Temple Grandin's work. And unfortunately um, for, I'd say the majority of people that are affected by sensory differences with autism, um, they're not always as positive. They can be sort of affect, they can affect how they experience stimuli in terms of it can be aversive, it can even be considered painful. And it can mean that some situations just are too overwhelming for um, them to be in. And why is this relevant? So I, from studying visual mechanisms, I sort of wasn't going in with this whole vision approach. I was thinking about the very low level visual um, information that we know is dictated by neurons in V1. So an example of this is orientation discrimination. So when we're sort of seeing a visual scene where our brain's actually processing these different features all separately. And orientation discrimination is the ability to tell tilt between two different stimuli. And this might seem really far removed from your vis like visual experiences in general, but it's one of the main building blocks that helps us put together um, key things like shape and understand how objects are aligned with each other. And this ability actually varies a lot more than you'd expect between people. Um, and we can measure it using specific sensory tasks that decrease and decrease the threshold until you can't see a difference anymore. So for instance, if you can see the difference between the two, the pair of stimuli on the left, that means your threshold's at least 10 degrees. And if you can see the difference between the pair on the right, it means that it's at least five degrees. And if you could still see both of those, then we'd keep going down um, until you could no longer see a difference. And it's pretty, I'm really bad at this. So it was really sort of astounding for me to realize I was getting less information about the world than other people. And it sort of made me think about what I might be missing. But it also made me think about, oh, sorry. It also made me think about how this might contribute to some of the sensory differences in autism, because it's not, it's not sort of um, unsurprising that while some people might sort of benefit from more visual information, we could see how that could become overwhelming. So it could sort of um, be one mechanism that contributed to these disparate sensory experiences that we see across the autism spectrum. I'm really briefly gonna go into how we can use our understanding of these mechanisms to really precisely guide our EEG approach. Um, and that's because not only can we study sort of perceptual thresholds directly, but we can measure them by going in and looking at neural oscillations. And this slides a lot, um, but all you need to really take from it is that our orientation abilities depend on lateral inhibition in V1. And the timing on which these occur means that they manifest as high frequency brain activity in the gamma range. Um, and we can sort of then interpret how differences in gamma speed just map back onto these mechanisms. So it's quite a sort of like a lot of information going into sort of one measure. Um, but this is the approach that I took um, to study a group of adults with autism. Um, these adults were all high functioning. You can see here from their um, IQ scores, which are T scores, they were all above average cognitive ability, which is um, not a super representative portion of the autism spectrum. But crucially, they could sort of do these tasks where we could measure these really low level responses. So we could um, see exactly which, what sort of amount of tilt um, each participant stopped seeing a different NASA. And then we could also measure um, peak gamma frequency um, in autism to represent these like visual oscillations. And I just wanted to quickly show you what these look like because I'm not sort of going in and talking about we're going precisely for a signal that we think's there that we can't see. 
If we go in with this guided approach, we know exactly what signal we should be seeing and it's really clear. So this is two different participants visual response. Um, so on the Y axis here, you have frequency. So this is just the gamma range. And along the X is um, time. And it's showing their sort of sustained visual response when they see a visual stimuli. Um, and while sort of we know that this is occurring within the gamma range, you can also clearly see that one participant is higher than the other. So um, participant on the left is occurring at around 50 Hertz, whereas on the right this is around 70. So we do see like large individual variations um, in these rhythms, which make them well suited for studying um, individual differences. So using um, this sort of conversion approach in autism, um, we found that we found better orientation discrimination, which meant that adults with autism could see finer levels of visual detail. And we also saw that peak gamma frequency was higher. Um, and not only were these two things altered, but they were also related to each other. So peak gamma frequency was related to orientation threshold. Um, and this obviously isn't surprising, seeing as that we know both of these, um, we were going in knowing that both of these, um, both of these features were governed by lateral interactions. So the direction of the results here would suggest that there might be more inhibition happening at this low level sensory um, processing step in autism. And this is interesting because we see similar um, patterns across other low level aspects of sensory perception. So we showed similar findings with similar interpretations in contrast. And in terms of auditory perception, um, pitch is pitch discrimination or absolute pitch is often reported in autism. So together these sort of suggest that low level visual or sensory differences in autism might be sort of appearing at this very first stage of basic visual processing, um, which is why we might sort of see these cascading effects through the system. And what I really want, so I want to approach, like um, show with this approach is that if we're thinking about neurobiological differences in a very specific way, we have to go in with a specific, um, knowing exactly sort of which way an EEG feature would move to know if it was more or less inhibition. And that's pretty rare. And um, so this is just an example I want to give. And it also, when I was collecting this data, I spent a lot of time with the adults with autism and as they were high functioning, they could also sort of, um, verbalize their sensory experiences to me. And I started to think about what value the EEG might have um, for participants who couldn't verbalize. Um, so if, if these gamma measures could help us look at low level sensory differences um, in a wider portion of the autism spectrum. And to do this, um, I was really excited to join CART and specifically Shafali's lab as her group um, was studying populations with cognitive ranges that were more representative of the autism population, which is pretty rare in autism. But um, while I showed up ready and eager to apply these measures, I quickly realized that this wasn't going to happen. Um, I should have really anticipated that data from adults um, who are very high functioning was going to look very different from um, children with a vast range of developmental abilities. And this is specifically a problem in terms of gamma, um, because if we think about EEG as in it's helping us listen into the brain's activity, gamma is a really quiet signal. So we need long recordings, they need to be like free of any other noise, and then we can start to see that gamma signal emerge. Whereas in developmental populations, we can't always give instructions like, like sit still, they, we, it's just a feat to be able to collect that data in itself. So when we do get the data, we're working with some constraints and those specific constraints so that the, um, the recordings are often task-free, um, so they're resting and a lot shorter. And they sometimes they have varying levels of noise um, and we have to sort of work around this if we wanna get insight into this, um, this population that we need to know what's happening. And this, I while you could go in, EEG is a quantitative measure, I could have gone in and measured gamma, I would have got a number. I didn't feel like this was like a meaningful approach. So at this point, I had to very quickly switch from um, what I've been training in for a few years and start thinking from a more top-down perspective. And the specific data set that I was really interested in and had access to was 
a set of rest and EEG data that was collected from minimally verbal children um, as part of a larger study collected by Charlotte de Stefano. And it was really valuable EEG from populations just, just aren't represented in the EEG literature. And I became really fixated on that. I was going to um, find measures that would help us understand hopefully the behavioral variability in this population. And obviously rooting that in cognitive changes makes sense um, given that that was sort of the main thing that varied across this particular sample. And the marker that I got very interested in um, is peak alpha frequency. So peak alpha frequency is basically representing the dominant signal in the resting brain. It's this large sort of slow-ish oscillation that's happening when we're at rest. And it's generally linked to sort of like the resting functional architecture of the brain, sort of like the default mode network is in MRI. And the peak alpha frequency shows some really interesting developmental traits. Um, it gradually increases in frequency. So this sort of activity gets quicker um, as children age. And then it reaches a stable peak in adulthood or late adolescence. And at this point, individual variations in peak alpha map onto different types of task specific cognitive function and also more general cognitive function. Um, so going from the general population literature and literature in other populations with specific types of cognitive disorders um, like neurodegenerative conditions, I thought this might be a good way for us to understand um, the neural differences that might contribute to the different cognitive trajectories um, that were present in this particular sample. So you can see here, just from looking at the um, bottom two rows of this table that when I said that the cognitive um, variation was large, it really was, it just um, ranged the whole spectrum. Um, and after like getting used to working with data that looked a lot different from what I was used to, I started developing ways that we could adapt our EEG processing pipelines to maximize signal quality. So most EEG pipelines are like built for adult data or like BCI interfaces that mean that like they're working with a clean signal, but we can start to adapt these and really sort of pull out the meaningful signals from autism, sorry, from more developmental data. And you can see here, this is examples of the peak alpha frequency. So while we were sort of working within constraints, we were still getting a clear neural signal, still getting, um, knowing that what we're measuring is, um, is a marker. And using this approach, we wanted to know if peak alpha frequency was lower in autism or altered in general, um, and if it showed the typical increase that we'd expect to see with age. And we found that in general, it was lower at a group level, um, but the individual differences, uh, sorry, the interesting findings came out or looking at the individual differences um, in that while typically developing children show this increase in peak alpha frequency with age. So you can see in this middle plot, they're just showing like a really clear um, increase in oscillatory speed. This wasn't happening um, in the children with autism. Whereas when we looked at cognitive function, we did see relationships between peak alpha frequency and cognitive function in autism. And what this sort of really highlighted to me is everything that we know about EEG and how it's been like studied for the last hundred years is really rooted in typical development. Everything we know is sort of how the brain should develop and how it should look. And so when chronological age and cognitive development are really tightly linked, um, like they are in typical development, we don't sort of see these interesting, um, we can't pull apart these interesting differences. But when we have this group of children with autism whose cognitive age is not necessarily increasing as they increase in age, um, we can see that peak alpha frequency is associated with cognitive function. So what this sort of suggests is that peak alpha frequency is measuring some sort of underlying neural marker that's important for cognitive function. And based on sort of previous literature, this would support that it is these large scale brain networks um, that are important for cognitive development and cognitive function. But as I sort of said, the, the main thing that we were going in for with this study was how can this be used clinically? 
And the nice thing is that this marker is really robust. Um, and we know this because a couple of years after we published our findings, um, a much larger, well, a study, if, sorry, a research group at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia replicate the findings almost exactly um, in a much larger sample. And they also measured alpha oscillations in a completely different way to us. They used MEG instead of EEG. So this is really encouraging, um, as I suggest that as a marker of neurobiological differences, peak, peak alpha frequency is A, robust and able to be measured and across different populations, and B, it's picking up this clinically in, interesting difference. And I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but um, this is just another example how, how, how we've been trying to sort of explore this marker now in other populations. So populations that might have developmental delay, but not necessarily specific to ASC, uh, ASD. So this is um, a group of children with tuberous sclerosis, which is a genetic condition that's highly penetrant for autism. And in these infants at this point, we're already starting to see um, differences in how the peak alpha develops between the first and second year of life. So when we're going in, I'll start with the negative. When we're going in behavior first, um, it does mean that our neurobiological interpre interpretations are a little broad. So if we want to get more specific and really like root this in more specific neurobiology, we've got to go and do that groundwork now. Um, so one way we've started to do this is by looking at other network characteristics um, that co-vary with peak alpha frequency. So this is just an example of um, some functional connectivity data from the same collected with EEG in the same population as we see the peak alpha differences. So this also sort of suggests that these large scale networks just aren't developing properly, um, or aren't developing as they should over this population. But um, when we have this specificity in terms of behavior, it means that it opens up a whole sort of world of applications for applying this behaviorally and helping it to understand um, and characterize what's happening in um, different scenarios. And one of the things that we're really interested in um, is examining if peak alpha frequency can pick up important differences that that might either like predict how a child develops during intervention or track the gains that they do make. So this is part of um, our Autism Center of Excellence project where, which is um, carried out by the CAS lab. And we collaborated with them to record EEG in those infants. So it's, giving, it's gonna give us this really cool way to see if um, we see brain dynamics that vary with cognitive change. So going over these sort of two approaches together, I hope that it's sort of shown that they do inherently sometimes require like very specific approaches um, and we can't always approach them both at the same time in the same population. But if we're thinking about both of these approaches when we're doing this work, it might help us align these sort of perspectives and work towards integration. And it also means that we are, avoiding relying on the tool first, which I think is a trap that um, is important that we don't fall into. Um, so if we go in and we just sort of measure any EEG differences without thinking about behavior on neurobiology, it means we're at risk of amassing an EEG literature that's just made up of isolated EEG differences that we don't know why they're happening um, and that don't really help move us towards clinical or scientific sort of progress. And related to this and thinking about how we need to like richly characterize specific markers rather than going and look at everything that we possibly could. The second thing I wanted to talk about today is um, understanding developmental change. So as a diverse and evolving disorder, um, we can't expect brain differences that we measure at one point in time to give us the full picture of an individual's developmental trajectory. We don't expect this in typical development, so we definitely shouldn't expect it where we might see more variability. So we need to be looking at markers throughout the lifespan um, and collecting them at multiple time points in the same individuals. And EEG measures are well suited for this approach because we can apply them consistently. If we're using resting EEG, so we're not relying on a task, um, 
we can collect EEG the same in a baby as we can in an adult. Um, we see the same sort of neural dynamics and it can help us understand sort of the background functional architecture of the brain and how it's evolving um, sort of separately from any contextual behavioral differences that might affect sort of when we look at this broad span of ages. And the other thing that I wanted to sort of, well, the thing that I wanted to really point out is um, that being able to characterize like normative EEG change is already really like, there's not that many people doing it. So going in with these approaches means that we're thinking about ASD as a developmental disorder and then trying to like disentangle that variability from a background of like, the normal dynamics that we expect to change um, just through sort of normal brain dynamics. Like I said, these patterns change constantly um, and we need to measure, make sure that we're measuring things that are sort of not state dependent. The first specific example um, I'm gonna give of looking at EEG changes um, to study development is infancy. And EEG is a particularly crucial tool during this period um, because we know that, like I said um, at the start of the talk, we know that there are very early differences in brain development. And because we don't start to see like um, behavioral differences emerge until around two or three years of age, EEG could offer us an opportunity to identify neural disruptions earlier, hopefully get infants or toddlers into intervention quicker um, because we know that this is like the maximal, this is the period where um, behavioral interventions could be maximally effective. And one way we've been doing this within CART is through our prospective studies of infants who have increased risk for autism um, due to having an older sibling who has a diagnosis. And this is a valuable population um, because we can identify these infants from birth so that we, we can follow their brain development from right from um, start of life over the first year. And I actually haven't got it on here, but we collect MRI at six weeks of age. And um, so we really are getting these sort of like early, very, very early um, insight into these populations. And using this sort of approach offers the potential to prospectively map atypical trajectories because around 20% of infants with familial risk will go on to develop autism. And again, I sort of, so the approach that we take um, in terms of EEG is we record EEG at four different time points. And then we have behavioral assessments that occur at 18 um, and 36 months. And at 36 months is when we sort of, the clinicians um, will make an, uh, uh, like categorize whether at that point we consider their child to have an autism diagnosis typical development or sort of an atypical developmental trajectory that's not autism. And this gives us like a lot of information because surprisingly and surprisingly to me, there is not a lot of EEG data collected at these like dense sampling points, even within typical infants over the first year. Um, so we know for at birth, the EEG looks very different to what it looks like at the end of the first year. Um, it's a period during which we see vast functional changes in the EEG. And so we're getting the chance to sort of characterize how this activity actually develops um, during typical development, and then look at if we can identify any differences in sort of how this manifests. And a lot of this has been looking at the signal and like trying to figure out where, where how we can characterize these really key developmental changes that we're seeing happen, but we want to be able to capture objectively. So I'll just give you a really quick example of this. Um, it's how we're trying to assess how like the spectral pattern reorganizes over the first year. So in the top left corner here is EEG at three months. And when you sort of saw before in the slides, the adult EEG where, or the child EEG where we had a peak in the alpha range, this just isn't present um, in the first few months of life. And it instead emerges. Um, and we basically see this sort of sequence of events where high frequency activity starts to sort of um, become more dominant and these really low frequency activities start to decrease. 
And this means that it's this sort of like chain of events and this um, it's basically like switch that causes the alpha peak to emerge. And you can see that clearly at nine and 12 months that we're starting to see um, an alpha peak that's very separate to this theta peak. And this is interesting in itself because a lot of people in the literature sort of thought the theta peak just shifted across and became the alpha peak. So data like this helps show that that's not the case. These are separate rhythms that are sort of um, replacing each other. And obviously when we're looking at typical development, we also want to know what's happening in atypical development. Um, and this is still work that's in progress, but I was just gonna show you um, what these spectral patterns look like in autism because it's actually pretty surprising. So the solid lines now um, are the infants who went on to sort of receive an autism diagnosis. And you can see that they're showing the same sequence of developmental changes, but they're actually occurring a little bit earlier. Um, at a faster pace. So we already see sort of some emerging evidence of the peak alpha at six months. You can see from the sort of standard deviations that some infants are already showing a peak at this point. And then we see a really clear and dominant alpha peak, even at a group level by 12 months. Um, and I should have mentioned, sorry, that this, the alpha, uh, sorry, the ASD group here is 13 infants and the um, typical group is 50 infants. So, um, is still descriptive at this point, um, but we can sort of look at how, how this manifests in terms of the peak alpha frequency. And what we see is basically, like it looks in the sort of group level data that the peaks emerging earlier, we're sure it's seeing a clear peak in, our, in autism much sooner than we are in the typically developing infants. And by 12 months, this alpha frequency is also higher. So this is really interesting, given that I had sort of um, been looking at how peak alpha frequency was delayed or lower um, after about two years of age in autism. And it suggests, um, this really bad figure, um, suggests that we might see some sort of crossover that's happening sort of maybe in the second year of life, where maybe, although we sort of um, would always think of being ahead of the curve in terms of maturation, we normally think of that as being okay. In the case of developmental rhythms, the timing of them and the sequence is so important that this early sort of maturation might end up being pathological. And we need to understand more about what the network characteristics look alongside that. Um, and obviously the nice thing is that we have MRI and EEG data from a lot of these infants. So our plan is to go in and see if um, we see sort of like similar changes in functional and structural networks measured using MRI. And we're specifically, this will be part of the ACE as well. We, we can do that in the ACE, but we also have the potential to do it through um, our collaboration with IBIS, which Shivali mentioned. And this is interesting because IBIS actually a few years ago found like a similar pattern of events happening um, in terms of white matter maturation so that we'd see sort of like increased white matter um, in the first year of life. And then this, would, this pattern would switch to be sort of like an under, under white matter, like a not as robust patterns of myelination. And we're really interested in how this maps onto peak alpha frequency, because we know from sort of a lot of the clinical literature that white matter deterioration has been linked to peak alpha frequency. And it might suggest that as well as sort of capturing um, the development of functional networks, we might be sort of, um, because they're so large scale, we might also be capturing like, the dynamics of how these um, distributed brain areas start to connect with each other physically. And that's just one example. Um, I thought that I would, if I told you about all the stuff we were doing in infants, I would definitely go over time. So I had to pick one um, and that's the newest and, um, most exciting new finding we have at the moment. Um, and I'm also really interested, um, now that I've been sort of so entrenched in development in what happens at the opposite end of the lifespan, so in later adulthood. And I've become more and more interested in this through seeing the parallels between um, aging, uh, sorry, developmental processes and aging protest processes. 
And we understand that they're like really, really tightly linked um, and in line with that, as well as increasing during childhood and being stable during adulthood, we know that peak alpha frequency declines in later life. It's one of the main neurophysiological changes reported in aging. Um, we know that brain activity gradually becomes slower. We also know that in conditions that are neurodegenerative or in conditions where we see sort of like more cognitive decline, peak alpha frequency declines a lot quicker or at a faster pace. So it might help us as well as looking at like the development of markers, it also holds a lot of potential in later life. And I'm interested in autism in later life. Um, again, like I said, because I, I think the parallels between development and aging are really interesting. And also because we know hardly anything about this population. Um, and that's not because they're not sort of prevalent. Um, there's over 5.4 million adults in the US currently with an autism, diagno sorry, an autism diagnosis. And we know that for most individuals, um, this is a lifespan disorder. And in the next 15 years, for the first time, older adults, so over 65 years, are going to outnumber children and adolescents with autism. With autism. So this is a big chunk um, of the population. It means that we really do need to start thinking about how brains are going to develop um, past sort of adolescence and mid-adulthood and how they're going to start showing changes that we know will happen due to aging. And there's a couple of different um, reasons that aging has become a particular, why I think that it might be affected in autism. Um, and one of those is because more and more studies are showing in general, in the general population, that social isolation and loneliness um, are some of the biggest predictors of adverse outcomes as we age. So having sort of like a less connected social group and things like that are actually worse for health outcomes um, than things that we know to avoid. Um, so things like smoking, um, eating things that are bad for us and drinking alcohol. These social factors actually play a much larger role and that means that not only are they sort of like the largest of the environmental factors, but that means that they are some of the largest contributors because our environment in general contributes about 70% of our variation as we age. So genetic factors account for 30, but the environment really is sort of contributing to the bulk. Um, and in the general population, I've really noticed a large public health initiative in over the, like all around the world. Um, to try and make sure that loneliness and social isolation don't affect the general population and don't cause functional declines. Um, so a few years ago, England actually appointed a minister for loneliness because they recognized this as such a big public health concern. And if we're thinking about autism um, and thinking about sort of the lifelong altered social experience um, that sort of like accumulates over life, we really need to know what effect this is having. Um, and if there are ways that we could maybe increase resilience um, or use alternate methods of like um, reducing loneliness and isolation. So um, we see lots of these in the general population. So I feel like we can definitely start adapting them to um, autism. The second reason that I've become interested um, is that we see sort of biological and neurobiological evidence emerging that suggests that aging is going to be a particular concern. Um, so along with sort of like higher levels of mortality and age-related diseases, we also see higher rates of cognitive decline and neurodegenerative conditions. Um, and we've just started to see the first few fMRI studies that show accelerated signs of physical and functional brain aging. And this stood out to me um, because obviously these things while the, the brain isn't aging in isolation from the body, um, if we're seeing changes in the brain happening earlier, that has a lot like really significant and severe consequences for our functional um, functional abilities. So we really need to know if this is happening. And I was interested in what we could see using neurophysiology. Um, so using the peak alpha frequency signal that I'd applied um, now to 
characterize different stages of the lifespan. I wanted to see how it played out in adulthood. Um, and to do this and to get a big enough sort of broad enough age range, I had to go to NDAR and get the EEG data that I could get. And fortunately, um, by pooling a couple of different studies, I was able to get a pretty big sample um, and measure peak alpha frequency. And we can see that in the group of adults with autism who were in red here on the left, peak alpha frequency is definitely like decreasing with age. We can see a clear difference between the younger and older adults, whereas really that's not there yet in the typically developing um, group, probably because while the age range went up to about 70, it was sort of mainly concentrated at the younger um, end. And also what was interesting is the sort of cross-sectional trajectories of peak alpha change. So we see this sort of steeper slope in autism uh, that suggests that peak alpha frequency might be declining at a faster rate. And as I sort of said, we can't figure out everything using EEG. We need to be bringing in other techniques. Um, and obviously with aging, we know that there's just so many things that are happening. We know that it's uh, a biological process that affects cells throughout our body. Um, and we, it would be helpful to know sort of how aging processes contribute to these differences versus whether sort of they might be um, more to do with the ASD phenotype itself. So to measure, I really want to measure sort of levels of biological aging um, in adults with autism. And biological aging basically means that you can take your cells, so um, we can get these from saliva, and guess, well not guess, uh, use a very specifically developed algorithm to predict your age. And that tells you whether your age is like, say, if you your predicted age comes back three years older, that would suggest that your cells are sort of like three years older than they should be, which suggests accelerated aging. So it's a pretty sort of um, scary measure. Um, and it's shown to be really accurate in terms of functional outcomes and health outcomes and mortality outcomes. And it's also really interesting because it, it's not just measuring aging processes that sort of start when we think of old age, it measures how it's really depressing. It measures how we start deteriorating straight away. So your aging can be accelerated from birth. Um, so it gives us an opportunity to sort of maybe try and measure if there's differences in aging at a time when we could potentially try and um, modify some environmental risk factors to promote more successful aging. So this is a proposal um, that I actually submitted as part of a KO1 um, to NIMH. And I'm specifically hope to study these markers in a sample of adults who have been studied by Kathy Lord for the past 30 years. Um, and they were originally recruited based on autism concerns. So they're a very sort of um, very rare population of adults with autism because they do sort of represent um, these children that have then been followed. Whereas sort of in normal autism research, unfortunately, those adults often like fall out of the system or we have no way to contact them. So this is such a rare and valuable opportunity um, to study a group of adults at a time when they're now entering their sort of third decade. And we might be able to see if there are individual variations that sort of contribute to how well they're aging. So one of the things that I'm really interested in is whether your level of social isolation um, or impairment might affect how your sort of biological and brain aging measures look. And this, um, I'm really excited to do this because like I said, I'm very keen to integrate measures and I'll be doing this um, with Kathy and with um, Dr. Judith Carroll and Dr. Dan Geshwin. So it'll give me this new, hopefully, um, training across epigenetics and genetics that I mean that we can start putting these measures together and hopefully um, interpret more of the neurobio, sorry, interpret our EEG measures um, in a broader genetic context. So I've talked about a lot today um, and I'm just showing this picture again because I really do think that it should, it's how we should be approaching EEG questions in autism. We're not going to have biomarkers straight away from the very first EEG study of a measure. We need to be um, incrementally studying these, characterizing them in specific populations um, and looking 
if we can replicate and then think about, okay, and what clinical context would this work in? And related to that, I think that um, if we're thinking about EEG as a tool that can measure functional changes that are constantly evolving, we, if we can apply it properly as a tool and not just as a measure, um, so we're not just like saying we're going to measure EEG, we're using EEG as a tool to measure these specific differences across the lifespan, then we might be able to sort of recognize what constitutes a typical developmental trajectory um, in autism and how this varies and hopefully identify protective factors um, or risk factors that we can either promote or attenuate to help people not only sort of reach adulthood um, at the best functional outcome that they can, but then retain these skills um, and not lose any, um, be able to sort of implement interventions early that have cascading effects, that have lasting effects on health span and life quality into later life. So I'd like to say um, a big thank you um, to CART for having me today and for being an amazing training environment and helping me to sort of really expand um, and look at all these different contexts um, for EG markers. And I'd really like to say thank you for Shivali for being an amazing mentor for five years and for having a lab that's super supportive um, and have been great to work alongside. And I also want to say a really big thank you to all the families and participants who've contributed to these re this research. Um, and I'm really happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Oh, Dan, you want to go ahead? No, 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 I beat you. I just wanted to thank you, but go ahead, Shafali, you're running the show, sorry. <laughs> No, that was, um, Dan, you ran, you ran the show, but uh, we, uh, no, thank you, Abby. That was incredible. And I think, um, I just wanted like taking a step back. I think what I really appreciated about this particular presentation is that it actually really speaks to the kind of depth and breadth of what UCLA CART offers, um, because there are, as you said, you know, in this rich environment that we have, you know, expertise across so many different levels of analysis, as well as, um, you know, um, areas of kind of clinical interest. And, and I think that the fact that you can take one method, which is what EEG is, it's not in itself a biomarker, but as a method and try to answer these questions across, you know, different sort of aspects of the autism spectrum, I think is really, you know, is very unique. And I think is going to make, you know, help us make huge strides in the field. Um, so I'll ask a quick question. And then I think um, I, there was one Q and A um, question that I'll ask, and then I'll, I'll, um, Hand it over to Dan. So, um, you know, I think you bring up some really important points about, and I want to just emphasize the point about making sure that we're really thinking developmentally. And, and I think that, you know, many of the studies in, in various sort of neuroimaging techniques, as well as other even behavioral methods, you know, have, have uh, sort of um, been vulnerable to this issue around, you know, studying kids or adults cross-sectionally, and then trying to identify differences that might be meaningful, right? Where maybe, and as we're seeing in many of these early infancy studies, sort of the, the marker of atypicality is in the change. Um, and I think that that's important from sort of understanding mechanisms, but I wonder, you know, how do you kind of reconcile that realization with this, like, I would say kind of urgency and tension towards, you know, wanting, cross-sectional biomarkers that we can use as early predictors or for trials. Because, you know, you even said in the beginning, and it's true, we all want these measures to be clinically accessible and relevant, right? So for instance, we want biomarkers that we can use to stratify kids for a trial, or we want a biomarker that tells us, hey, this is going to predict, this predicts that this infant is at much, much higher likelihood of having atypical development. But if the, if the real, you know, sort of insights are in change, you know, then it, that sort of undermines our ability maybe to make, you know, sense of these sort of cross-sectional markers. And so I just wondered if you could maybe comment on that. Um, and I know there's not one answer to that question, but I just wanted to know your thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah. So first I'd say that I feel like MRI and behavioral measures are sort of in a, a little bit of a um, better place than EEG because for instance, we don't use like adult MRI templates to look at baby um, MRIs, we don't use adult behavioral techniques with babies. Whereas in the 
EEG literature, really, we've just been using what we know about adults and children to study um, infants. So although that does mean that things are now a bit slower when we're going in sort of with an infancy first perspective and trying to describe that before we even um, can look at atypical change, I do think that some of the, especially the predictive measures where we can use them to be descriptive. So obviously if there's a lot of EEG studies now um, across different clinical contexts that will say we can predict a diagnosis or a particular outcome by putting the signal in this black box and it'll tell us the outcome. And whereas like, I think that that is still not the most helpful, um, these powerful approaches that can go in and tell us where the differences are that are predictive, I think that they could sort of guide us towards where we need to be looking. So use these machine learning and like deep learning approaches, um, but use them in sort of a bit more of a, a tool to like learn where we should be looking rather than saying, you do it for us, we'll just trust that um, you've picked out the signal. So there's a couple of questions in the Q&A about how one studies low functioning, or I, you know, I presume that means that a low IQ adults, especially. Um, could you comment on that? Um, yes, definitely. So with EEG, um, one of the nice things, like I mentioned, is if we use like the a repertoire of tools that can help like acclimate children to the um, EEG net and things like that, things that our lab have worked a lot on, then we can sort of collect data from lower functioning um, children. And I haven't collected data from lower too low functioning adults yet. Um, I've sort of collected data from adults who are just below. Um, but hopefully um, through the K proposal I put in, I'll get an opportunity to be able to figure out how we can get insight into adults who are a lot sort of um, a lot more developmentally delayed or a, more, a bigger range of that. So it gives us the same insights that we're getting from EEG in childhood, um, but showing us like, what's happened in those sort of like 20 years age difference between those two groups um, and give us a nice comparison group. Great. Um, I have more, but I'm gonna turn it over to Dan to let him ask a question and then I'll take it back. I just have one question, um, um, which is, uh, it seems that, you know, I mean, one of the, I'm trying to figure out exactly how to frame this, but you know, like, so you have a biomarker, you know, a kind of a physiologic, you know, that's, it can be a biomarker. It can be a, um, an actual, you know, more than a biomarker, right. Actually looking at actual, um, not just marking, but giving a uh, functional insight into what might be happening in circuits and stuff like that. And then, you know, you want to connect this to various levels like, um, like behavior. And then you're talking about genetics and epigenetics, which is uh, fantastic. And um, I'm wondering if you've thought about or what, you, you know, um, a lot of the way that we do these analyses involve what I'll call essentially linear methods and, and don't account for nonlinearity in these uh, relationships. And I'm just wondering what you think about that moving forward, especially if we're, if we're thinking about the nonlinear relationships between these potentially between these different levels of analysis. Yeah, so that's actually something that I've started considering within EEG. Um, so, for instance, with the alpha rhythm, obviously I'm measuring this sort of like one big signal, but we know that there's obviously different sources contributing to that. Um, and there is now sort of people who are able to discern those rhythms from one another and use like dipole localization to look at lower levels in the brain, not too low, but hopefully like at least um, map different cortical layers onto each other. That's something that I've been thinking of in terms of nonlinearity, um, especially thinking sort of if we think that a difference at one level might not sort of have a, the effect that we'd expect at the next level. It might not cause the, expect, the effect that we'd think because of a compensatory mechanism, or it might sort of correct itself. So within EEG, I've been thinking about that. Outside of EEG, I definitely, that is definitely what I want to be doing um, and mapping on to sort of trying to get at these mechanisms that 
we can't get at with EEG. We can't get at sort of the really sort of cellular level um, mechanisms. No, thank you. So, um, you know, another, um, so actually, let me, a Q and A question. Then I had another one. Um, there was a question about someone asked if you could elaborate on how environmental protective and risk factors could be studied later on. Um, and I think, yeah, uh, that, that question uh, is, I think, clear enough. But <laughs> later on, um, in terms of the lifespan, I think that we have like. There's pro that's probably the point at which we've seen the most characterization of environmental and risk factors. So um, it's mainly done by looking at health outcomes. So we'd look at sort of mortality risk or um, different things like heart disease and see the sort of factors that are associated. So obviously the ones that come up a lot are physical things like um, diabetes or obesity or um, alcohol and cigarettes and like I said those social factors we know um, are important later because in the typical population we see this sort of we see this socialization fall off with age um, so we know quite a lot there in terms of the later risk factors um, and I think the benefit of bringing them earlier is other than the like sort of obvious ones of like knowing that we should be exercising that we should be doing certain things there's more subtle things that we can be doing that are actually promoting um, aging in ways we might not expect. And I was thinking about that a lot with applying it to autism, because if we're sort of saying, there's no point in saying social isolation is bad for you, stop being non-social, like that is not gonna work um, in a population who's characterized by social impairments. Um, but there's lots of different ways that you can actually sort of get around actual social contact um, and I think it's all rooted in stress, basically. Any way to reduce stress, and if you feel like social isolation um, is stressful, I think that that's, um, that's gonna be sort of the main factor. So I think in terms of what you were asking, um, later in life, we definitely see a lot of different things into play. And you have to think like the whole lifespan sort of contributed at that point. But if we can start to disentangle them earlier, it might give us a better idea of like which one are driving which, like stress underlying them all, are they contributing independently? Um, and it'll be interesting to look at that in a population where um, social isolation might actually not be stressful. Um, so socialization might be the stress factor um, for some adults. Um, so it looks like there are people starting to drop off because they're past 10. I know we have till 1030, but I'll ask one more question. And then if there's others in the Q&A, um, those you can, um, I think, finish after this. So a you know, question I actually get asked a lot when I give talks on um, neurophysiology is, um, is around the implications for therapeutics and particularly around neuromodulation. Um, you know, you've shown, I think you didn't show these data today, but you've had, you've, you have a beautiful study that shows differences in you know, uh, essentially sort of distributed brain networks and, and connectivity through phase coherence as early as three months in infants who um, end up with autism symptoms um, and are likely going to be diagnosed with autism later. Uh, so we see these, you know, again, these sort of distributed brain network differences very, very early. Um, you're showing obviously in adults also, you know, differences in um, low level sensory processing, which obviously have a very clear and I'd say much more well-defined neural circuitry um, than some of the more, again, distributed networks that we're seeing affected maybe in earlier infancy. But I wonder, you know, what, do you think that there's promise in neuromodulatory techniques directly targeting some of these putative circuits? And if so, you know, could those actually have implications for later behavioral and cognitive, you know, developmental outcomes? Yeah, I think in terms of adults, definitely. So there are a few studies now that show that peak, actually peak alpha frequency training, so where you train the peak alpha frequency to be higher and more consistent across the head or the scalp. Um, there's a few studies now showing that that actually improves cognitive function in typically typical elderly adults. Um, and I think as well as um, a few now like sort of showing just generally improving cognitive function by doing that um, in a non-aging context. 
developmentally, um, I makes me much more like reluctant in terms of, we obviously know that we can identify like a typical pattern of what should be happening, but we don't know how like modulating at one point is gonna have a knock on effect. So for instance, with the peak alpha frequency, if you had asked me to guess what we'd see early in life, I would have said that peak alpha frequency might emerge later. And it's not, it's emerging earlier. Um, so if, if that was something that we'd gone in, if things being at like the wrong time might be just as um, harmful as them like happening later. So I think with development, it gets really complicated, but definitely in adults, um, I'd be way more confident being like, yeah, we could um, see that as a, like a treatment response, uh, sorry, a treatment option that's pretty feasible and is being done now. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to make one more point, I guess, based on your, again, really inspired by your work, but I think that, you know, one thing that, one of the themes that keeps emerging, I think, in our field in general is this one of heterogeneity and the fact that there's like developmental heterogeneity as well as clinical and etiological and everything else. But, you know, we're, we are constantly hampered by this issue of small, quote, non-representative samples. And I think that we're in the sort of EEG field, we're at this point where there's, this realization that we cannot keep publishing one-off interesting mechanistic studies that are not only not replicated, but maybe don't, you know, necessarily generalize in a way that could be applied down the road. And I, I think that, you know, we're at a point, this inflection point where I think we need these large, large consortium level efforts. And I think, you know, what you did with NDAR and pulling those data was heroic, honestly, because those data are difficult <laughs> to query for quite a few reasons, meaning from an electrophysiological standpoint, but you did it. And I think, I think about what, you know, Dan started so many years ago with Agree, which was, you know, this goal to have one genetics registry that people share their data, right? And that allowed for, you know, larger representative sample sizes to be able to answer some fundamental questions. And I would just say that I think we're at a point where we need to do that across our kind of imaging and again, sort of more functional imaging me measures like EEG. And I think once we get there, some of the questions that you're trying to answer will be much more, I think, effectively answered, you know, in a way that I think is, will push us towards using these measures, um, you know, it, again, in trials or in any other, um, any other capacity. So um, thank you, Abby, for your outstanding presentation. Um, I don't see any other um, any other questions here, so I will um, I will close the session. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Everybody. Thank you for listening. Everybody have a great weekend. Take care. Thank you. Bye.